This is problem 16.134, it's on page 753. End B of a 15 pound uniform rod AB rests on a frictionless floor while end A is attached to a horizontal cable AC. Knowing that at the instant shown, the force P causes end B of the rod to start from rest with an acceleration of nine feet per second squared to the left, determine A, the force P, and B, the corresponding tension in cable AC. So the schematic of what we're looking at looks like this. Here's the cable. Uh, this is point C over here. This connection point is A. Force P is down on the ground pushing on the rod at B. And the length of this thing total is five foot. Now, of course, they told us that the mass of this rod, I guess I'll put that here, is five pounds. No, 15 pounds, pardon me. And then the height is four feet. So this dimension is four feet. Hopefully that shows up on the screen. If not, you've got it there in your text. I'm going to define a coordinate system, as I usually do, but uh, write x of y. And then to calculate the inertia moment, which I'll need, uh, it's just ml squared by 12. So let's just jot all that down. We know that the initial velocity is 0, and that the acceleration of point b is 9 feet per second squared, and that's to the left. Okay, we're supposed to find how much force P is required and the tension in cable AC. So I'll just call that tension T. Let's start off with a free body diagram. We'll analyze the kinematics and then sum forces and moments. So free body diagram, kinetic diagram, here's the rod. The weight will act in the center of the rod at point G. P, the applied force, will act at B. And there will also have to be a normal force from the floor. But I believe they said that this is frictionless at the floor. Let's double check. Yeah, without friction. No, wait a second. I'm reading the wrong problem. Yeah, frictionless floor, there it is. So to say it, they have to give us a friction coefficient otherwise. But then there's a tension force, T applied to the end of the rod at A. Okay, now that is equivalent to, well not equivalent, I think the correct word is equal equivalent. The result of this, in other words, is potentially an acceleration in the y direction, acceleration in the x direction, so there's our, our dynamic forces in the x and y direction, and also an angular acceleration or a dynamic moment. So let's start off with kinematics. I'd really like to know about the, the acceleration of the center point G. So in the kinematics, let's see, the acceleration of point G, what could I relate it to? Well, point A is a good point. Notice that point A cannot accelerate left and right, but it can only accelerate up and down. So that seems like a reasonable point to go from, but then on the other hand, point B can only accelerate horizontally, right? It can't accelerate vertically, otherwise we'd lose contact. So why don't I start off with B, since that's the point where force is applied, and let's just see what happens. So acceleration of G with respect to B, just writing a relative acceleration equation. Now as I said, B can only accelerate in the horizontal direction. So I could write that as a negative i, because I already know the acceleration at that point. Actually, that's a really good reason to go from b, because I, I know the magnitude of the acceleration. It's to the left, and so I've taken care of that by writing negative i. So that, that takes care of the acceleration of point b. But then if I consider the motion of g as a motion relative to b, then this relative motion here will only consist of tangential and normal acceleration, which is 
convenient. So it would be plus the acceleration of g with respect to b in the normal direction, plus the acceleration of g with respect to b in the tangential direction. Now we begin from rest. So this, this rod's not rotating or translating at this point. So the normal acceleration, which would just be an omega squared r type of term, I don't know what length I want to use, uh, what would it be? Well, it's uh, b length over 2. If I define this dimension as length, which I already have right there. Anyway, uh, since omega is 0, this term is 0. So there is no normal acceleration to worry about. There is only tangential acceleration. So that's going to be an alpha L over 2 type of term. OK. Now, we have to be careful here, because what is the tangential direction? What would that look like? And how would we convert that to an x, y coordinate system? Well, let's think about that for a moment. We're thinking about the motion of g about b. So let me, let me draw the, uh, the rod, which you notice is conveniently a, uh, let's see, 5, 4, 3 triangle, or 3, 4, 5 triangle. That's the geometry. So, but the point we're thinking about as our reference is point B down here. And the point we're interested in is this point G up here. So, if we think about normal motion of G with respect to B, the normal direction is pretty straightforward. like this. There's the normal direction. But what about rotation? We're talking about an alpha type rotation. So an, an angular acceleration, right? So I always take that counterclockwise or positive. So if I think about G rotating about B in a positive sense, then the tangential direction, move my 5 out of the way, is like this. So now I've got the proper tangential direction. Now, let me extract that tangential vector because I want to think about it in terms of x and y, or i and j. Now this 5 length is at a fairly steep angle, so this will be at a shallow angle. What that means is that I've got another similar triangle where the hypotenuse is the 5 side, this is the 3 side, and it's the 4 side. Right? Just figuring out intuitively. So now, this is also the, the j side, and there's an the i side. So what that means, notice that, of course, it points in the opposite direction. These both would point right and up. That means that the tangential vector would have to be what? Well, let's see, negative 4 fifths i, 4 fifths i, minus 3 fifths. Now, how did I know to make both negative? Well, because t has a negative component in both the x and the y direction, or the i and the j directions. Okay. So, let's clean things up a bit. This would be negative ab in the i direction. This one's gone. This one is going to be what? Let's see. Plus alpha l over 2, but rather than writing t, we'll write negative 4 fifths i minus 3 fifths j. And now we're done with this. All right. Now let's collect the i terms together. So negative a, b quantity plus, right, because both these are negative, so we pulled the negative sign out, alpha l over 2, 4 fifths. Now, the 2 and the 4 can be combined, right? So that would just be 2 fifths. And those are all the i components. And then we have minus alpha L over 2, 3 fifths j, but 2 times 5 is 10. So 3 tenths j. So there's the acceleration of g, and notice that this is with respect to ground now, right? All we did is we said, if we know the acceleration of a point with respect to ground, with respect to the reference frame, and we know the relative acceleration of uh, 
the point of interest with respect to that grounded uh, reference frame or that point which is in the grounded reference frame, then we should be able to calculate the acceleration of the point of interest with respect to the reference frame. So that's what we've done. Now let's see, what do we know and what do we not know? Well, we know A, B, we don't know alpha, right? That's the angular acceleration. So it looks like we've got a, an equation, but also an unknown here. So we don't know everything about the acceleration of the center of mass, but we do know the center of mass is, uh, let's see, no, we don't need no either one. We need alpha. Nope. Well, what else could we do? Well, like I said, we do know something about point A. Couldn't we also write that the acceleration of point G is related to the acceleration of point A plus the relative acceleration between the two? We can play the same game, but going from a different reference point. Remember what I said that was so valuable about point B is the fact that, well, number one, we knew the magnitude of its acceleration, but also we knew its direction. That directionality is really important. We knew that B only accelerates horizontally. Similarly, A only accelerates vertically. Now, A would accelerate horizontally if AC was already rotating. Then there would be a, a sort of a normal acceleration of point A about point C. But we could still go back to point C because point C is not accelerating. In that case, if there was some angular uh, velocity, we go from point C to point A and then from point A to point G. Now, our problem is a little simpler than that because there's no motion yet. So all the, the normal acceleration of A towards C is, is zero. We don't have to worry about it. A only accelerates vertically. But that's something important we know about the acceleration of point A. It only has a, a J component. So we could write this as acceleration of A in the J only direction plus, same game we always play, right? Acceleration of G with respect to A in the normal direction, plus acceleration of G with respect to A in the tangential direction. Of course, the reason we do this, because we know this one will go to zero, since the angular acceleration is zero, we have another omega squared L over two type of term here. And here we're going to have an alpha L over two type term. But now we have to figure out what this tangential direction is. This tangential direction is different than what we had before because now we have to think about the rod pivoting about A. And how does G move if we have a positive angular acceleration alpha, you know, or think of it as a rotation about A of G? Well, in that case, obviously, the normal direction is pointed from G to A. Of course, that direction is not really useful because it's a zero component. But with a positive angular acceleration, our tangential direction will be up and to the right. Now, of course, we're talking about the same line that we had before when the tangential direction was down, when we were referencing the motion of G about point B. But now T is pointing positive. And so we'll still get the same kind of term, but it'll all be positive for T. See, so what we had before will work. It's just, it all needs to be positive instead. So, this is equal to, let's take them term by term, acceleration of A, J, direction, this one's zero, plus alpha L over two, that takes care of this piece, and then T, as I said, would be positive four-fifths I plus three-fifths J's. So, let's see. Why don't I go ahead and write this down in the J direction. I did it a little differently in my uh, solution, but this is fine. We'll take uh, uh, alpha L over 2 times 4 fifths in the I direction. Now, 2 times 5 is, of course, 10. That's substitution. There's the I component plus the acceleration of A plus alpha L over 2 three-fifths in the J direction. Now, two-fifths is 10. Here we go. Okay, so now we've got an I component and a J component. Now we can start to set these equal uh, to one another. 
So if we consider in the x direction, I'm running out of space with the kinematics. I think we're almost done. In the x direction, what do we have? Well, let's see. We've got this. So notice these are both acceleration components of g, right? So this i component has to be equal to this i component. So we can write negative of ab plus uh, alpha l times 2 fifths is equal to alpha l times 4 tenths. Okay, just taking this piece, that's here, and setting it equal to this piece, that's here. Because these are just expressions of the x component acceleration of g. If we take the y component and relate them, well then that's right here. So that's negative alpha l 3 tenths equals, well let's see, it has to be this piece. So the acceleration of a plus alpha l 3 tenths. Okay. Well, let's see. I could rearrange this, right? I could take this alpha L3 tenths and move it to the other side. And then I would have two of these that are negative. So it would just be negative 6 tenths alpha L. But 6 tenths are 3 fifths. And now I have a relationship between the acceleration of point A and alpha. Now, I'm not sure that it's all that valuable, right? Because I don't know what the acceleration of A is in the Y direction. I haven't figured that out yet. Okay, well, let's play around with the X term. Let's put the negative sign inside. And notice that I've got alpha L two-fifths, but four-tenths is also two-fifths, isn't it? So if I move this to the other side, well, I'd have two of these, right? Two alpha L two-fifths. Two of those would be four-fifths. Move that to the other side. And now I've got something useful. Because look, negative AB is equal to alpha L four-tenths. Well, let me verify that with all the algebra to make sure I didn't make a mistake along the way. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's fine. So what have I gleaned so far? Well, let's see. I would like to calculate alpha from here. So uh, alpha, jot down my notes from the kinematics, alpha is equal to negative AB, that's this side. Let's see, divided by L times 5 over 4. So that's what I've gathered from here. And if I want the acceleration of point A, I can get it. I'm not sure that it'll be valuable, but I'll go ahead and jot it down. The acceleration of point A equals negative alpha L three fifths. You know, I could relate the acceleration of point A to the acceleration of point B. That may or may not be useful. Putting these two things together, let's see if I plug in alpha, I plug in all of this. So negative, negative will cancel. Uh, let's see, alpha will be gone. The L's will cancel. I'd have AB, that would not cancel, times 5 fourths over 3 fifths. So the 5's would cancel, and that would be 3 quarters. Now, as I said, I don't think that's uh, particularly useful, but it is interesting that we can calculate the acceleration of point A, which is vertical, as 3 fourths the acceleration of B. What else do I need? Well, I need to know more about uh, the acceleration of the center of gravity. Notice I, I kind of sidestep the acceleration components of G, but I need them. I need AY and AX. So how could I get at those components? Well, now that I have an expression for alpha, I can either choose to plug in here or I can plug in here, or I could plug in some combination, because look, haven't we found that we could write the acceleration of point G in one of two ways? It doesn't matter which way we write it. I'm going to choose the simpler way for I, and I'll choose the simpler way for J. So I could simply say the acceleration of point G is equal to, well, let's see, alpha L 
two fifths in the i direction, just simplifying that four tenths, minus alpha L three tenths of j. I don't have to use this form. Right? Why bother with it? I can choose either component I want. Both of these are the i component of the acceleration of g and the j component of the acceleration of g. And now that I have an expression for alpha in terms of the acceleration point b, I can find the acceleration of the center point in the x and y direction. So let's get rid of some of this mess here. We're still working with kinematics. So let's see, the acceleration point g equals alpha. So I'm going to plug in alpha as negative a b by l 5 fourths. So that's alpha times l times 2 fifths in the i direction minus alpha. Instead of alpha, I'll plug in negative a b over l 5 fourths. That's alpha and then l. From here, 3 tenths in the j direction. Okay, well, let's see that. Fives cancel in the first term. Two fourths is the same thing as one half. The L's cancel. So all I'm left with, left with for the I component is negative AB over two. Does that make sense? That means the acceleration of the center point is half the acceleration of point B. And remember, I'm not going to plug in a negative AB here and say that G accelerates to the right. That's not the case. The acceleration in the x direction is a negative thing. That makes sense, right? If we push on the bar in this way, it's going to move that way. So this acceleration had driven the wrong direction. It's not a surprise that ax comes out negative. So we just found that this, which is the x component, is negative ab over 2. So 9 over 2, that's 4.5 feet per second squared. But we'll get to that later. How about this piece? How does it simplify down? Well, let's see. The l's cancel. It's easy. And 5 fourths is the same thing as 10 eighths. That way the 10's cancel. And we're left with 3 eighths. The negative signs cancel. And we've got, uh, what, 3 eighths AB? So the acceleration in the y direction of the center of gravity is 3 eighths AB. Now we're done with the kinematics. Section that off, I guess. Now does that make sense? That the center point would accelerate in the positive y direction? Yeah, that makes sense. If we're pushing to the left, it's got to accelerate upward. So that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so now we're really done with all the kinematics. Now we can finally sum forces and moments and see what happens. So I'm going to Start by summing moments about point G, taking counterclockwise as positive. Why is that a good idea? Well, if I sum moments about this point, uh, let's see, I'm not sure that it was a good idea. I'll involve the normal force as well as P, which I want. Whereas if I were to sum moments about this point, I would only involve T. Uh, then I'd have the complication of these accelerations, but I already know those, so that's not really that much of a complication. For whatever reason, I chose to sum moments about G, maybe not the optimal choice. That's what I did. So negative t l over 2 times 4 thirds. Where does all this come from? Well, I need the moment of point t, which is a clockwise, which is a negative moment. I need l over 2 of this distance, but I don't want all of it. I want only the vertical piece, and that's the 4 fifths piece. So that's where this comes from. How about p? Well, p also causes a clockwise or negative moment. l over 2 is this distance, but again, I only want the four-fifths piece of it. I want just the, the vertical height. The normal force causes a moment. Now it causes a positive moment about g, right? That would be L over 2, three-fifths, because now I want the horizontal distance. So plus n, L over 2, three-fifths. And this would be equal to since I'm summing moments about the center of gravity, I don't need the moment of the dynamic forces. It would just be equal to I alpha. Okay. Now notice, I don't know P. That's one of the things I'm looking for. I don't know the tension T. I'm looking for that. And I don't know N. I've got three unknown forces here. 
Now, fortunately, I can get at the dynamic moment alpha because I know the acceleration point B, so that would be just plugging in numbers. But that means I'm going to need two more equations. How about if we sum forces in the y direction? So that's uh, M minus W equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. But the acceleration in the y direction, we already know, is 3 eighths acceleration point B. So there's the sum of the forces in the y direction. If we sum forces in the x direction, what do we have? Well, we've got positive T minus P. And that's equal to the mass times acceleration in the x direction. But the x direction acceleration is negative AB over 2. So if we solve from this equation for the tension force T, it would be equal to P minus mass times acceleration of point B over 2. All right. Another thing I should have done is from summing forces in the y direction, I probably should have solved for the normal force. It would be equal to the weight plus 3 eighths m AB. Okay. So now let's plug all of this into our moment equation and see what we get. So negative, I need T. The T can be represented as P less m AB over 2. That's T. I have to multiply by L over 2, and I have to multiply by 4 thirds, so that takes care of this term, minus P, but P can be written, uh, let's see, or can it? Well, I want P, so I'll just leave P alone. Yeah, so minus P, L over 2, 4 fifths. Now, wait a second. I wrote four thirds here, and I wrote four fifths here. Did I mess up? Yeah, I messed up. I'm sorry. I should have written four fifths here. I don't know why I did that. I was talking and writing at the same time. It didn't work. It was this distance, which is going to be the four fifths distance. So I'm sorry I messed that up. And this, three fifths, uh, yeah, that's the horizontal piece, so that should be fine. I did it right in my solution, so I made the mistake of the board. Uh, so where were we? We were copying down terms. We've got that one copied. That's done. I'm going to have to break the line and say plus n, but n can be written as the quantity of w plus 3 eighths m a b l over 2 3 fifths equals i, but i is m l squared over 12, alpha is negative AB over L, 5 fourths. In fact, I think I'm going to set my solution aside for a moment and just verify that I come out to the same point uh, on the board. Because I'm going in a slightly different way than I went with my solution. So this uh, L over 2, I would like, notice it appears in the three terms on the left. I'd like to invert and multiply it. So 2 over L, we'll get rid of the L over 2 on the left-hand side, 2 over L on the right-hand side. And this was negative AB over 2. That looks like an L, but it's negative AB over 2. It's uh, from right here. No, it's not. It is an L. It is an L. Almost messed up. Because it's a negative AB over L5 force. There we go. Now, these L's cancel. So we don't need all the L's anymore. And 2 times 5 is 10. Or I could have left it 5 as 5 over 2. There's a lot of fractions to simplify here. Well, what else could we do? You know what, I wrote four-thirds here. Now I'm questioning myself because of that. I think I copied that wrong also. That was T, a little bit too. Yeah, I copied that. And it was wrong when I copied it. So it should be a four-fifths, not a four-thirds. Now the weight is pretty easy. That's just mg. Let's make that substitution. And let's see, will the mass cancel? No, not quite. Okay, what else 
could I do? Well, I could multiply through by four fifths. That would simplify things. All right, five fourths. If I multiply both sides of the equation by five over four, these will go away. And let's see, both sides is multiplied by five fourths. 